The scripture today is Luke 24, verses 28 through 35. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then he then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. We're going to try an analogy. and We'll see how far it goes. We're going to talk about an accordion. I want you to imagine an accordion in your mind. And what I know of accordions is what I have seen and what I have heard. I have never once played an accordion. I don't think I have ever once held one in my arms. So bear with me if you're an accordion player how many things I get wrong. But I want you to imagine an accordion and you've got like the center piece, right, that for the wind and the air and the compressions. And then you have the piano side and you have the button side. Are you with me? You, you got to really be with me today so that I know you're here and you're listening and I'm not like totally off in left field. Okay, I think that studying the scriptures is a lot like playing an accordion. In that, some folks will tell you just read it for what's on the page. We are not those people. <laughs> because if we read it for what's on the page, it's like the accordion is just tight and there's no air, which means there's no movement. There's nothing to play. You can't elicit anything with the keys or with the buttons because it's just tight. And you can see what's on those external folds, but there's no dynamic to it. There's no music to it. There's no play. So can you read the Bible just what's on the page? Just see the external folds? 100%. And there's so much more if you sort of open it up to see what lies between the folds. What happens when you sort of push and pull on it, when you begin to play the keys and touch the buttons, when you sort of allow life to come into the scripture, music happens, right? And in the hands of different musicians, it'll sound different, the Bible is kind of like that. In the hands of different preachers or church folk, it'll sound different because the way that we compress it and pull it, the ways that we play it, the rhythms that we have, even playing the same song, so to speak, it'll sound different. And often when we read a scripture passage, all we have is the compressed version. We've got just these external folds that happen. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. Some guy said that, some guy responded that, then this happened, then this happened. And it can sound a little bit flat. But if we sort of open up to what's possible and understood both about the scripture in its context and the culture of the day and to our story, then it becomes alive and vibrant and fun and dynamic. So we're going to do a little bit of accordion work this morning. And the first exercise that we're going to do is we're going to talk about the table. What does the table mean to you? What has a table meant to you growing up? And for the whole of our series, we have a dining room table. We've got chairs, this amalgamation of mismatched things. We've got dishes and napkins and flowers, right? Things that are part of a table. And I want us to be imagining tables all along as we go through this series. But first, I want us to pause. I want you to literally think think about what it meant to sit at the table in your home growing up, what it meant to offer hospitality in your home growing up. I grew up in a home where we always had enough. There was always enough food in the fridge. There was always enough food in the pantry. There was always enough that you could not just find something to scrounge, but you could always make a meal. You might have to get a little bit inventive, but you could always make a meal. I grew up in a home where people were always welcome, whether that was family or extended family or friends or church family or neighbors, there was always room. And I grew up in a home with about 15 of these. Some metal, some the classic Tupperware style, right? And this is how my mother cooked. We were five. 
But regularly, she made enough to fill this bowl. Potato salad, pasta salad, fruit salad, regular salad, any kind of anything. My mother made enough to feed an army. You could feed 50 people out of one of these things. Did you know that? And I know that because once you make a bowl this big for a family of five, you get to eat on that food all week long. Which as a child is not so grand. But as an adult, I see the abundance that was there, the provision that was there, the welcome that was there. Somebody could have stopped by unannounced any day of the week. And you know what? We could have easily invited them to the table. Right? That for some of us is one experience of the table. It may be your experience of the table. For me, it was common. That's what I experienced in the homes of my aunts and uncles, often of my friends, folks that we were invited to. But there was one particular time where I was struck by the difference in what it meant to have enough. And I was at a friend's house and we were there, I think after school, it could have been a summer day, I don't really remember. I was probably junior high age, 12, 13, somewhere in there. And we were hungry. So we went looking through the cupboards for something to eat. And there was not. There weren't crackers, fresh or stale. There weren't cookies. There weren't chips. There weren't bananas or apples or oranges on the counter. There wasn't cheese or milk or cereal. There just weren't those things. And we weren't starving. We were just hungry adolescents. So we, I don't think we even ate. Maybe, I don't even know. I wasn't hungry. I remember that part of the story. But I remember her mom was in the middle of shift change and she came home to eat something, presumably a meal but there wasn't a meal to be had. And so what she grabbed was a dinner roll and a jar of molasses. There wasn't peanut butter. There wasn't jelly. There weren't deli meats. There wasn't cheese. And it was a simple thing and they were nonplussed by it. It wasn't a dramatic thing. It wasn't an overreactive thing, but it was something that stuck in my brain. 28 years later, I remember that they didn't have much. It was enough. She had six kids and she managed and fed them here and there, but, but it wasn't like the experience that I had. And I remember staying at a different friend's home and they generally had enough too, but uh, it was the end of the month. My parents were away. I was there for a few days. And it was the end of the month, and so it was, well, the cupboards are a little bare because we're waiting for the paycheck to come in. Some of us know that experience, right? Generally, there's enough, and at the end, it gets a little bit tight, and then you get paid, and there's a little bit more, and it's enough to hold you through the month until it gets a little bit tight, and those months where the end of the month just seems to keep getting further and further out. Some of us know what it is to be food insecure, to grow up without enough. And some of us, our experience of table has nothing to do with food and everything to do with who we are and how we have or have not been welcomed. Some of us have always been one of them, right? Whether that's based on our race or our language or immigration status or economic status or our sexuality or our relationship to the family or our gender identity, we have always been an other. So even when we're invited to a table, we come with caution, maybe a bit of weariness. Will I really be welcome? Will these be the people who say that thing that everybody seems to say? That they say I should just let roll off my back, but really sort of slices to the core of who I am. For some of us, a place at the table is about food and being able to extend our table. And for some of us, a place at the table is about inclusion. It's about being seen and known and loved and recognized and truly welcomed. I want us to think about who we are when we come to the table. What's the framework that we come with as kids? Because it influences how we read the scriptures, how we hear it. That's the accordion view, right? It's not just what the scripture says. We bring our own stuff. So when they say Jesus was walking along a road with two men and they came to the town of Emmaus, their destination, and it was late in the evening and Jesus was going to carry on and they said, no, 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 stay with us. And so he did and they stopped and they stayed and they sat and they ate. That's about table. 
That's about welcome. That's about hospitality. That's about having enough. Because we don't hear somebody making do. We don't hear somebody going without. We don't hear somebody sort of in the background. How am I going to make this do? Well, I guess I won't have this. I'll just have a chicken wing instead of a leg because there's not enough. And I got to give some to the guests, right? We don't hear any of that, which is really what happens when you have an unexpected, uninvited guest who comes to the table. Oh, I only cook for four, but now we're five. Okay, I guess we'll make that work. And you have to do it somehow. There's this, there's this welcome that happens at the table. But before we stop there, we're going to backtrack a little bit. Are you still with me? Okay, this is a resurrection story. This really is the day of the resurrection. It's an Easter story. And the context that we have in chapter 24, just before where we read, is that the women have gone to the tomb. They've seen Jesus. They've reported back to the disciples. Some of the disciples have gone to the tomb. They've seen the empty tomb. Those guys have reported back to the disciples. These guys are on the road. They are seemingly disciples because they know about the women. They know about the disciples. They've heard back. Some of us went to see, and they are on the road. And what we hear in the scripture, if we're reading the Greek, is that they were despondent. These guys weren't celebrating resurrection. These guys were like, huh, There was this great guy named Jesus, and we were learning from him, and we were spending time with him, and he was amazing, and he was healing, and he was doing things, and then he ticked off the wrong people, and they killed him, and he died, and now somebody stole his body. Guess there's no more point being in Jerusalem, and so they start walking to Emmaus. Now, we're given a distance between Jerusalem and Emmaus that's about seven miles, but we aren't given an orientation about north, south, east, or west. We don't find it in the map. So somewhere in the circumference of Jerusalem sits Emmaus at about a seven-mile radius. And these guys sort of leave Jerusalem despondent and put out and hopeless and discouraged. And they're on the road, and this guy comes up and starts talking with them. This guy who they really should know, but somehow his appearance in the resurrection is different enough that they have no clue who this guy is. And they're kind of, you know, doing an Eeyore, walking along. Jesus is like, what's up? And they're like, what do you mean, what's up? Are you like the only person who hasn't heard? There's this guy named Jesus. He's this really great rabbi, and he got killed, and now his body's missing, and there's no point to any of it. And Jesus is like, really? Tell me more about that. (laughs) So they engage in this conversation. Then Jesus is like, well, you know, let me do some Bible lessons while we're at it. And he goes through the Old Testament scriptures, which is not a book at that point, right? It's oral tradition still at that point. But he's pulling on the traditions, basically pointing to himself, drawing these things together, highlighting the road that all things point to Jesus, but these guys don't see it, which is a common theme with the disciples, right? Like these are the most clueless bunch of guys you've ever met um, until you sort of empathize with them. And then you're like, well, we're really the clueless bunch of guys that we've ever met, right? We're among them. We're some of them. We might not see it either. And they're there and they've got all these tells pointing straight at Jesus, but they're not there, but they know they like him. They know they want to spend time with him. And so at the end of the day, when he's off to be on his way, they say, no, 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 come on back. Come eat with us. Stay the night with us. It's late. You don't want to be on the road at this time. And Jesus is like, okay. And the table is opened for him and for them. Now, we aren't given the particulars of who or where or what was served, but we could maybe reasonably assume that it's home for one or both of these guys, right? Because where else do you show up at the 11th hour? It's 7 o'clock, 7.30. It's dinner time, and you're like, hey, guess what? I'm here to eat, and I brought a couple friends. Where can you do that safely? Come on now, home. You go home. Mom's like, oh, you're here more people. You show up anywhere else and they're like, you could have called first. I mean, it's first century, so no, but still some sort of humility or understanding in that regard. And so they open the table and Jesus is welcomed and they sit down and they're sharing this meal together. And we aren't given the dynamic of exactly what transpires. They don't say, no, Jesus took the, it was probably not a loaf of bread. It was probably like non-flat bread, right? Jesus took it and he lifted it to heaven and he gave God thanks and he broke it and he shared it with them and said, this is my body. We don't know that he did that. 
He could have just like tore his bread and started eating like anybody else at the table. But something in that tearing like turns the light on for these guys. And they're like, oh my goodness, you're Jesus. It's like, I don't know what you were listening to for that whole seven mile walk that we just did. But yeah, I was kind of pointing to that. And then he's gone. Well, wait, wait a minute. We just figured this out. We could have asked you some things. We got some more questions. What was it like to be in the tomb? And then how did you feel when you were dead? And then what about that resurrection thing? How did that go? Like they could have had all this thing, all this questions, all this anticipation, all this curiosity. And Jesus is just like out. But they don't go back to being despondent and discouraged. What do they do? They run back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples that whole thing you told us. It wasn't hogwash. It was truth, you guys. It was true. And we saw Jesus and we talked with him and he talked about all the scriptures. And we saw all these pieces come together. And then we sat at the table and we thought we were just sitting at the table. But then he broke the bread and we saw We saw him. We saw Jesus. He's alive. This is a resurrection story. It's one where the people go to proclaim the good news. Jesus is alive. And we don't know exactly how it transpired. But what we see is that something profound happens when they broke bread together. When they participated in that ritual together. And some of us are clamoring for that knowledge, for that witness, for that understanding. What is it like to sit at a table with Jesus? What is it like to hear his voice? What is it like to hear those stories? What is it like to see him? And that's part of why we tell the stories in church, in worship, in Bible study, is because in telling the stories, we're pointing the way, saying all things lead to Jesus right there. And if you look at this, and you look at this, and you look at this, and you look at this, there's Jesus. And some of us are like, if you look at this and you look at this, I just see these things, right? We haven't had that moment where we see with truth and clarity who Jesus is. And so then we're invited to participate in real and tangible and tactile ways to participate in something familiar and known and recognized so that we can experience Jesus, so that we can see him in truth. And so we come to the communion table and we take the bread and we break it. And on one hand, it looks just like breaking bread. It's just a loaf of bread. And on the other hand, we know that in the breaking of the bread, God has the power and the opportunity and the will to do something profound for us and in us. In the breaking of the bread, God has this desire to reveal God's self to us. And we often participate in the ritual. We lift it up to heaven, imagining Jesus doing the same. We say, thank you, God, for this bread. And then we tear it and we break it and we give it to each other. Maybe saying, may this be the revelation of Christ that you need. May this be the food that helps you truly see him. Even though you've known him, maybe there's something more, maybe something distinctive, maybe something even more profound in the resurrection for you to experience where you're going to get it like really get it and we offer the cup with the same intention the reminder of the promise that christ has made this is the cup of the new covenant the covenant the promise that jesus makes with us and for us and to us this is his blood which is shed for us that we might be forgiven and so we break the bread and we drink the cup so that we can say god show up to me <laughs> Because there are days when I don't get it. I don't see it. You're right there in front of me, walking with me, telling me, teaching me. And I'm like, dude, where's Jesus? And I'm despondent and I'm hopeless and I'm fearful. And what I need is for God to show up and say, I am here. I am the risen Lord. How much did those guys look back and wish he had done the same for them? That he had shown up and say, I'm the risen Lord. But they were seeing him, talking to him, hearing him voice. And they couldn't even see him for real, right? They didn't get it. So even if Jesus had said, look, I'm Jesus, right? I'm the risen one. Hello, look, what do we got here? Maybe they wouldn't have seen. Maybe it was only in having sort of this build up. This anticipation, these stair steps that finally led to this aha moment so that they could really see him. I wonder if we've seen him or if we want to. Are we ready to? 
Are we looking for him or are we looking around in hopelessness and fearfulness and despondency? He doesn't say, hey guys, wait till you're ready and then you can participate. He just spends time with them and then sits with them and is like, okay, cool. And what comes next? Well, we have a little bit of bread and here's some cup and let me share with you and we just have this meal together. And there together is this Jesus moment. So in a moment, I'm going to invite you to come up for a Jesus moment. And I can't make any promises about the revelation that you'll have, about the scene that you'll have, because that's not my job, right? That's God's job. But what I know is that something profound happens in the breaking of the bread, in the sharing of the bread, in the drinking of the juice. What I know is that sometimes we need more than head or theory or even heart. We need something we can touch and taste and smell. We need God in real terms in our everyday life. And so we come to the table where there is always enough, where there is always room. It's part of why we offer an open table in the Methodist church, where everybody gets to come because we believe that God's grace is for everybody, that the revelation of Christ is for everybody. And so all are welcome and invited at this holy meal. We have... The leavened bread, we have gluten-free bread, we have the juice that is juice, not wine, so that hopefully you don't have anything impeding a decision to come to taste and see and smell. God is alive. Christ is risen, and he is among us. Let us pray. Holy One, we give you thanks for who you are to us and for us and with us. We give you thanks that you see how thick and cloudy our vision can be, how hardened our hearts might be. And we ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit to reveal yourself to us, to teach us new things that we might see you in new ways, that we might share who you are with others. We ask that you would bless this bread and this juice, that you would transform them as you transform us. Make us be the body and blood of Christ, that we would be for the world a living witness. Christ is alive, and he is here among us. Forgive us our sins, Lord, for anything that stands in the way of you and your grace and our relationship with you and others. Renew us that we might receive this gift wholly and fully. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.